So I said last lecture was a, a toolkit. It was uh, if you want to do simulations or if you want to even ever make any judgments about simulations, you know, what, what, what are the basic tools in a numericist's uh, repertoire? Um, I'll be going on towards the end of this lecture telling you about some simulation results. And this is where we actually start to talk about physics a bit more. However, I wanted to stay, start with the first half of this lecture being on a different subject, which is, suppose you've run your simulation and you get an answer like this, which you do, and I'll probably get to show you the movie of this later on in the, in the lecture. How do you compare a sort of ratty distribution like this with uh, uh, stars and filaments, etc., to observations? I mean, I think probably most of you would say, yes, it looks pretty much like an embedded cluster, but how do you make a kind of quantitative judgment as to whether you've succeeded or not? And so in a way, although I might be saying a lot of what I for the first half of this lecture about how you analyse simulations, it's really no different to the question of how do you analyse observations, just empirically, what descriptors are we going to use to take something like this and say, is this a decent realisation of, you know, Orion A or Taurus uh, or whatever. And the problem, of course, is we can't sort of plot nice king profiles like in an old wax cluster. We've got uh, lots of ragged entities to uh, cope with. So, Starting off with, how would you want to characterise the gas structures? Now, obviously, this, this um, slide is far too busy for you to take it all in. So it's just that if you're into wondering whether the gas structures in a simulation are comparable with what observers see, there are a variety of different ways of uh, characterising structures in, in the gas. And just a couple of them, but an old pattern reference to structure functions... Um, use of dendrograms by Rosolowski. I'm not going to explain any of this, it's just there if you want to follow it up. And probably what many people do is use a sort of clump find type algorithm to extract from a density field what are the, the peaks which are then called clumps or, or cores according to preference. And there's a lot of discussion uh, out there at the moment about the relationship between the mass function of clumps and cores that you derive through the use of such algorithms on observational data and comparing that to the IMF. Are they the same? Are they the different? Are, is there an offset between the two? Etc. Etc. Now I'm not really going to delve too deeply into this because I'm a bit of a, a clump mass function sceptic. And um, just to say, um, partly through doing reading in preparation for this lecture, good paper here by Penedra et al. in 2009, The Perils of of, of clump find and just how sensitive the results you get out in terms of the mass spectrum are to various algorithmic choices you make. Um, not an expert on this, but this is a good place to go to and explore from there in assessing you know, the, the level of credence that you want to give to uh, clump mass functions. By the way, I'm not for a moment saying that there's nothing in them. Indeed, it's an empirical constraint that your calculations have to fulfil, but whether you're actually saying we are learning about you know, distinct entities which are going to turn into stars um, and which we've identified in an unambiguous way, I think that's more of a, of a stretch. Um, and for example, here are two analyses of Rho off by Mott et al. and Johnson et al. They both were using dust maps. They were different dust. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was going to ask if they take yeah. into account uh, projections in the observations since you could have like, a call that looks like a club point. Oh, right? absolutely, yeah. And that needs to be uh, absolutely, yeah. So, of course, in, if you're doing it with observational data and you've got kinematics, you use the information about the velocity as well to give you some handle on the, on the third dimension. So, yeah, this, this reference is a good one for exploring what you do if you've just got projected stuff or if you've also got some information about the third direction from, from kinematics. Um, the, uh, yeah, I was just saying that in these two analyses of row off, um, both sets of authors agreed on the clump mass function, but they actually disagreed on the clumps. Um, and they were both using millimetre data. So, again, th this sort of discourages me from thinking that every clump is a well-defined entity which one can therefore you know, map onto uh, a star. Um, of course, if you have a simulation, you can play with your simulation and observe it just as an observer would and run all the same algorithms on it. And a couple of nice papers by Rowan Smith and Ian Bernoulli and collaborators doing just that. And again, a bit in the same spirit as the, this Pineda reference, they found that the, the results for sort of breaks that they found in their resulting clump mass functions were very dependent on the algorithm that they used. And here's the quote, analysing fractal-like structures with any clump-finding algorithm will generate a clump mass function, but the details of the clump properties, especially the mass, depend on the type of algorithm and the parameters chosen. So 
there, there may be those of you in the audience who are far more expert on this than me, which wouldn't be difficult. So if there's a, a counter story to be put, then, you know, again, let's hear about it um, a, a, over a beer. But um, there's no doubt that simulations have to be able to reproduce the empirical evidence that when you look at them as an observer would, you see a kind of spectrum of clumps of different uh, masses of the right form. And incidentally, they do. So they pass that test. But in terms of the significance and physical reality of those clumps, well, we'll come on later in the talk to saying, looking at those clumps and seeing whether they can actually be identified with particular stars which were born from that particular mass reservoir. In nature, they may be, but in the simulations, it's a, a not, not such a clear uh, correlation. Now, getting on to characterising um, stellar structures, a um, nice paper by Larson in 1995 uh, analysing um, just distributions of stellar... Yeah. The question just popped in my mind. I mean, yeah. Usually with simulations, the advantage is that you actually mm. know the answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. When you look at these simulations, yeah. would, it, would everyone agree on where the clumps are? Well, no, because... Like, like, are they clumpy? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so they can, you can extract a clump mass spectrum from it. I understand that. Yes. But yeah. What, I, what I'm yeah. saying is, would everybody agree? Well, they they don't agree in in row off, right? So right. people wouldn't agree on the actual locations of the clumps, but everybody running a clump find on it would agree they're clumpy and would get a, a mass function out of it. I think what I'm asking is, if you yeah. took that simulation, you projected it in yeah. 3D, you rotated it around, and yeah. you let John Stone and the other fellow look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Would they pick out the same clumps? Is it obvious where the clumps are in these simulations? What by your eye? Yes. Um. I, I don't know actually. Well, neither uh, do I. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I also don't know if you could do that with a molecular cloud, whether the, the clumps that go into a clump mass function fulfil that criterion oh, either. Yeah, but, I mean, well, I no, don't you can't answer, answer that, right? Yes. Cloud to fulfill yeah. it, but if we're going to talk about clumps, I hope yeah. the simulation might fulfil it. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I think it's just sort of a data yeah. issue with a yeah. signal to noise, and it would yeah. depend on the you know fidelity of the observation that they mocked on that thing, whether yeah. they would agree or not. But I think yeah. one thing to keep in mind, yeah. maybe Bob yeah. is headed there, yeah. you can find something that's not bound, and it could be transient. And then if you would let it yeah. go for a few yeah. more time steps, yeah. it would go away. Yeah. And indeed, you find yeah. those in these clump find algorithms. Yeah. And if you came back in the simulation at a later time, yes. you'd find different ones. That's a slightly different issue, which yeah. I'll come back to that's later right. when you actually play God with the simulations going forward in time. But I was just saying, just take a snapshot. What would an observer say? Um, yeah. So uh, you mentioned that like you can take yeah. this cloud structures and track them yeah. possibly. Yeah. So uh, that yeah. uh, is yeah. scale invariant. So yeah. uh, if you then if you have some cloud that's a true trackle, yeah. then the number of clumps you find it yeah. seems it would depend very much on the scale because yeah. if you go to look at a very small yeah. scale, then yeah. you'll find yeah. many more. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, like so the, so they so yeah. actually yeah. defrack yeah. down to yeah. like the lowest levels. Yeah. But is yeah. that that's really that's exactly problem. part of the problem in fact I think it's probably there on the, that the resol because the, the spectrum depends on the observational resolution because of the hierarchical structure. That's another way of saying exactly what what you're what you're saying, I think. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to leave gas now and just talk about 2D projections of stars uh, on the sky. Um, Larson had a nice way of characterising this. He just said, so I've got a cluster like this. I put a kind of bullseye target down around every star and put a, a narrow annulus, R to R plus DR, calculate how many stars there are in there and work out a surface density in that annulus for that star. And then I do exactly that for all the stars in the cluster and add them up and take an average. And I plot that as a function of how large the annulus that I put down is. And what you get from that is here you're basically mapping the distribution of binaries. If you took a binary distribution that was flat in uh, log A, which isn't quite the same as a Gaussian, but uh, it's not, not that uh, uh, far off, you'd actually get a minus two slope here, which is pretty close to what you get. So this is an exercise that has been done in, in Taurus, uh, taking the mean surface density of companions and plotting it against the separation on the sky. So that's the binary regime out to about 10,000 AU. And then if your binaries were sitting in a uniform sea of stars, then out beyond some radius, it would go flat, right? Because then it wouldn't depend on the radius of your 
uh, sampling uh, annulus. But it doesn't, it slopes. And so I think this sort of whole thing about stellar distributions being fractal probably does start, as many things do in this field, with, with Richard Larkin pointing this out. Uh, Matthew Bate and myself and a bunch of others went back and did lots of sort of analysing synthetic clusters to see just quite how degenerate um, this problem is. And it is very degenerate. In other words, there are loads of different structures, including a global density profile, including non-fractal clustering, including fractal clustering. Loads of different kinds of structures give the same slope here. So maybe, I think this is probably part of the reason why this is no longer the preferred method of choice for analysing um, the distributions of stars on the sky. There's a very nice method uh, introduced by Cartwright and Whitworth a few years ago using the minimum spanning tree. I'm imagining most of you probably use it or are aware of it, so you just take a bunch of points, join them up by the network which minimises the total length of the, the points without any closed loops, and then the, having created this tree, you've got a whole ensemble of edge lengths which are the vectors connecting the stars together. And the clever thing that Cartwright and Whitworth did is they said, let's boil down the different kinds of structures that you get down in, in, in star-forming regions into a single parameter called the Cartwright Q. And it's a ratio of two lengths calculated from this. The numerator is the mean edge length. So by mean, I mean, obviously, adding up over all the stars. But for each star, it's only its nearest neighbour that determines the value of that quantity. Whereas the thing on the denominator is, again, an average over all stars, but for every star, it's not the nearest neighbour, it's the average distance to a star in the, in the cluster. And what they showed was that if you take this parameter and then generate lots of synthetic clusters and see how they look, what this parameter looks like, it's a pretty well-defined mapping between uh, the nature of the clustering and the value of the Q parameter. So I think this deserves a little bit more uh, explanation, although obviously go to the references if you don't catch it in, in real time. If you do this exercise on a uniform distribution of points in 3D, then the answer is 0.8. It's not particularly obvious why it's 0.8, but it is 0.8. So that's the point you start from if everything is spread out uniformly. And now, a little thought experiment here, and I don't know if you can see it in the gloaming. Supposing you, you now divide your um, survey area into low-density stuff, black, and high-density bits. And what's above this line is supposed to be a, a fractal-like distribution, by which I mean that you've got high-density bits, but they're quite well separated from one another. This is supposed to represent more a global radial profile, so the high-density bits are all co-located. And it turns out that if you think about what happens, if you take a, a star out of here and place it in there, what you're doing... Thank you. So if you take a star from the low-density bit and put it down into the high-density bit, you obviously change the nearest neighbour distance for a couple of stars down there enormously by doing that. So you change the numerator of that uh, expression there. But you don't change the denominator uh, very much because for most stars, the av their average neighbours are, are way out there and not particularly changed by that moving down to there. But if instead you take all your dense regions and bunch them all together in the centre of your cluster and do the same exercise, yes, you're reducing the numerator as you bring one of these in here, but you re reduce the denominator more because there are lots of stars down here which register the fact that the average distance of stars, of stars from them is being changed. So whether you really think it's a diagnostic of fractals or not is a, is a bit of a stretch, but I think what it's really showing is that as you go away from being uniform, if you, your dense regions are all co-located, like they would be in a radially concentrated cluster, you increase the Q parameter, and if they are dispersed, as they are in, in, in fractal realisations, then you decrease it. And so it's a lovely way of just sort of finding a single number to sum up the state of your simulation or the state of your observations. And in fact, uh, a number of people have, have, have applied this to both simulations and observations. Now, the minimum spanning tree is great because it doesn't have any particular uh, preferred geometry. You can use it on any ratty cluster. 
And one particular useful thing that uh, Thomas Maschberger and collaborators uh, did a couple of years ago was to take a simulation, which we'll hear more about later in this talk, and basically just say that if you just cut the minimum spanning tree of any of its branches are longer than a certain length, and say that everything <coughs> that is uncut, bunched together, is forming a cluster, you've got an empirical definition of a cluster. We're not asking whether it's bound. We're just saying, taking a snapshot, if I analyse this data, and I impose a cut length of 0.2 parsecs, or whatever I want to uh, impose, then this is what I will derive for the clusters. I suppose the beauty of this is that you can do exactly the same thing to the observational data. So as I say, it's very, it's, it's very empirical, but uh, it does mean at least that if you've got the simulation and observation, you can compare them side by side. And there are lots of other fun things you can do with um, edge lengths, um, and in particular, we'll be coming on to later, how you can look at, at, at mass segregation, so seeing whether stars which are more massive uh, are more concentrated, which you've already heard a, a little bit about in, in previous talks. And that's the basis of this very nice uh, method by Richard Allison, pioneered a couple of years ago. It's just saying, take a, a bunch of, say, the 10 most massive stars in the cluster and look at, connect them together with a minimum spanning tree and ask, what's the average uh, edge length for that minimum spanning tree? And then repeat the same exercise for lots and lots of samples of 10 random stars from the cluster. And then say, well, is the, the mean value for your 10 most massive significantly different from the mean value for these random samples. And what I like about this method is that it's self-calibrated in the sense that when you do the, the Monte Carlo exercise of picking all your samples of 10 random stars to compare with, you get a dispersion as well as a mean, and therefore you can say, well, actually, my 10 most massive stars are four sigma away from the mean, or whatever. The only slight wrinkle is what statistic of the minimum spanning tree should you be using to compare, and, and is the mean edge length the, the best one? Um, and sometimes that can produce slightly counterintuitive um, results because, of course, a mean is very sensitive to outliers if you use an arithmetic mean. So in this little cartoon here, um, we've got uh, a bunch of, say, low-mass stars, these dots, and the massive stars are actually a bit more closer together on average. But there's one guy out there. Well, if you work out the uh, min mean edge length for the massive stars, you'd get a, a high number, and so you can, you'd conclude, oh, well, these, the system is inversely mass segregated. Um, you, 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 you wouldn't necessarily want to draw that conclusion, but it, what I'm, I'm saying is that you could have a, ma a cluster which is conventionally mass segregated with the massive stars in the middle, but because you've got one outlier, say an OB runaway or something like that, you actually conclude that it's inversely segregated. So then there may be other ways of comparing the... Um, uh, edge length distributions, maybe using a median or a geometric mean or looking at the whole edge length distribution. Hello. Um, so both the, the mean yeah. and the median, they, they, they will be, so this, this I imagine will work very well on a simulation where you have the information of all the stars that the simulation produced. But when you uh, go through real observations, especially yeah. of, of yeah. Um, crowded clusters, of dense clusters, yeah. then won't this be severely, I would say, affected by incompleteness? I think that's right. You've got to, you've got to do it on complete, uh, on complete data, right? Is that even possible? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you might want to be very selective about the region that you decide to, uh, to look at. I mean, Richard can probably comment on whether Taurus is reasonably complete. I think it probably is, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I also add something? Yes. Yeah. More defend myself. Yeah. Oh, there's nothing to defend. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. That, what, the yeah. example that you put yeah. in the diagram there, I yeah. agree that that's yeah. a potential problem. Yeah. What you should always do when using the yeah. MST, whether it's the mean or the median, yeah. is to vary the bin size yeah. and vary the subset length. Yeah. So you can look at the 10 most massive stars or the yeah. 20 most massive oh, stars. Absolutely. Or yeah. And if you're seeing some yeah. fluctuation just by changing the bin, yeah. bin length, that's probably telling you that yeah. there is a problem with the geometry. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing yeah. you can do is the original Alison yeah. method was to yeah. step out in, so you, you look at the 20 most massive stars, then the 26 or the 30, you know, yes. the 32nd, and, the, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So then you're getting a picture yeah. of how it is evolving yeah. as you're building up the sample. Yeah. And I think you can yeah. get rid of yeah. that potential problem very easily just by. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I've been arguing with Thomas for two days about this so far. So. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't want to argue, because I actually think, in, in, fundamentally, it's a, it's a very neat method. Um, and, and yeah, I'm sure you're aware of all this. Yeah. But just uh, yeah. to what Joanna should say, yeah. 
that's absolutely correct, mm. but this general problem, if you analyze the uh, integration of cluster, it's not a particular problem with the method. So, oh, I, mm. I agree yeah, with the, the methods, the methods mm. suffer. Yes. The There's much more more. Mm. That was a question yes. to the lab. What, what is the entire batch length? Oh, it just means that you could construct a minimum um, spanning tree for your subset of stars and look at the distribution of edge lengths. Just the entire cluster? Or? No, of your subset. But then what's the difference yeah. to mean? Do you think in the mean or the... No, no, because you, you could then do a KS test of the distribution of edge lengths against the, uh, the other random samples. And so that's not so sensitive to just one diagnostic. Um, so that's another thing that we're, we're, we're looking at at the moment. Sorry, uh, Mike. Can yeah. you just yes. on the completely yeah. yeah. great point. Yeah. Uh, I, one would want to use, say, an extinction limited sample or something like it in an embedded cluster when you're sort of working in the near infrared. That only traces the surface population. It doesn't get deep enough into the cloud to really look at the deep central density structures, which we're probably almost interested in. And I guess the only defense I can make it for the for the C two D like teams is that IRAC was so sensitive. Know, it just got so far down the mass function uh, over most extinctions, and as long as you're not too crowded, I would argue that some of the work those guys did in the nearest bimolecular clouds probably doesn't suffer from extinction the way many other studies would have done. So. I agree, but there are, there are just very few clusters where the clouding is not an issue, and they're all close by, so they're all very tiny. Yeah. So Wimpy in a way compared to where way. most yeah. star formation mm -hmm. might occur. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. mm -hmm. That's very interesting, thank you. On characterizing IMFs, um, one thing you shouldn't do is to bin up your uh, IMF in a histogram and put a straight line through it, although it's probably what most of us would do instinctively. Um, if you want to know why not, I'm sure Thomas or Mashberg will be happy to tell you why not, or there's this uh, reference uh, from 2005 talking about the, uh, the uh, perils of, of that particular exercise. Um, if you want to test your, say, your power law tail of a mass function, against a given power law, so is this saltpeter? A good way to do it is to use a KS test to do that. But you have to be a bit careful because KS tests are not sensitive near the ed edges of the cumulative distribution, <coughs> the extremes. Now, normally that may not matter, but in a few lectures' time, we'll get on to the thorny question of in integrated galactic IMFs and whether the uh, IMFs in individual clusters are truncated. And if you're trying to look at observational data and decide if your IMF is a power law which just goes on and peters out due to finite sampling, or whether it's a power law which has got a definite truncation, then you need to have a statistical test which is sensitive at the extremes. And there's a stabilizing transformation. Again, if you look at the Mashberg and Krupa paper, that will tell you uh, what you might want to do if you're interested in that particular feature of the IMF. So isn't yeah. the yeah. uh, Maïs Atlantis problem yeah. alleviated if you use a constant number of objects? That's, that was their suggestion, that's, that's right. Now, to what extent it's alleviated? I don't know, if, Thomas, if you want to make a comment on, on that. Do you think it's... Uh, you've looked at this probably more than anybody. Well, I, I think it all... I mean, what, what you should do is... You, the IMF is a probability distribution, and you fit it as a probability distribution, and you use best uh, uh, something like uh, a, a much likelihood Instead of you know having hundred data points, if you reduce to five, you can fit fit something too. Mm. Okay, that's one of the hands somewhere. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, with the Anderson yeah. Darwin yeah. test work for uh, the stabilizing transform or something. Well, what, what's that? It's, Sorry. Uh, yeah. It's a, yeah. like a version of the KS yeah. test. Okay. But I think that yeah. it's, it's something yeah. statisticians yeah. Yeah. work quite yeah. frequently. Yeah. Okay. There we are. But, yeah. Funnily enough, if you do the stabilizing transformation, then the KS then is the, the most powerful test, the Anderson Darwin test doesn't have much more. Okay, I probably should uh, press on because now I've wound up the bit of just talking about how you look at observational data. I want to show you a simulation which over dinner last night. Uh, when I was describing it to Mike, he just kept on describing as the ex exploding sausage, but I think you'll find it rather less dramatic than that title suggests. But it is the largest simulation of a star cluster formation ever um, uh, conducted. It's got 10 to the 4 solar masses. This is Ian Bunnell's work from, from a few years ago. Stress, it is not the simulation of choice if you're interested in binaries, because remember sync radii, 200 AU. 
So when I talk about binaries in a few lectures' time, I won't be using this simulation. But it's the best simulation for looking at cluster formation, because with 10 to the 4 solar masses to start off with, you're forming you know, thousands of stars and clusters in, in, involving hundreds of, of objects. And so you actually start to get a picture of the sort of large-scale cluster assembly. Um, the initial conditions of this uh, um, simulation are pretty interesting. It's a cylinder, um, and it's marginally bound. Now, you shouldn't be shocked at it being marginally bound because I kept on banging on about that uh, uh, yesterday afternoon about how you know, that's, that's the way clouds seem to be. But it's got a gradient, a subtle gradient and density along it, so actually it's just somewhat bound up at this end and somewhat unbound down the other end. And that's quite interesting because it means that you can study, amongst other things, how the boundedness of the cloud affects the, the star formation there. We could probably talk about the simulation for the rest of the lecture. Uh, I'll show it to you, um, but I only want to draw out a few threads from it during my remaining time, and there'll be other stuff that I'll discuss um, tomorrow. So, oh, I should say what the initial conditions were. Okay, there's a one-off shot of turbulent energy in this. So you actually impose the Larson law turbulence in the, in the initial velocity field, but then you let it go. You don't, you don't uh, uh, meddle with it after that. Um, it's what is sometimes called a vanilla calculation. It's got the minimum ingredients in order to get a star cluster formation. It's got no magnetic fields, no feedback, and a very simple prescription for the uh, equation of state, the pressure going as, as density, which is basically isothermal at most of the densities you can see in this simulation. OK, go. No. Go. Come on. Yes. Right. You might want the, 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 the... Can we close the curtains a bit now? I'll, I'll, I'll show it once again, because I think it is... It is ra oh, yeah, that's better. It is rather beautiful. So that's the, 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 the top is the bound bit, the bottom is the, the unbound bit. So we're still forming stars down in the unbound bit, because there are locally sheets that shock and create stars, but they're at much lower efficiency. That's got to come again. Okay. But what I really want you to look at now is the fact that the clusters, as they form, are forming hierarchically. The first things to form are small n-body entities at the intersections of colliding filaments, and you'll see them starting to light up there. Uh, and then they're starting to fall together and create larger uh, entities. And if you look up in the upper right, you see that uh, you are creating a sort of fairly populous cluster as a result of that. But all the stars there really, or most of them, started their lives as few body systems, which quite rapidly accumulated. Now, what does quite rapidly mean? This simulation ran for half a million years. So everything that's going on in the simulation probably goes into the category of being primordial, if you're talking about mass segregation or, or, or whatever. But as I say, if you actually dissect back where those stars have come from. They form in small body systems and they accumulate hierarchically. And so, Sorry. yeah. So the, the simulations, as far as I understand, have, have a, a very uh, large uh, amount of turbulence, right? I mean, larger than what is observed. No, no, they, as I said, they're marginally <laughs> gravitationally bound, so that makes them compatible with a large category of uh, molecular clouds. But the, but yeah. the, the, yeah. The amount of turbulence, is it, is it realistic? Or? That's, what, that's what I'm saying. I mean, the I mean you can parameterise the turbulence in terms of its total energy compared with the gravitational binding energy of the cloud. Yeah. And that, that is actually designed to be somewhere sort of quite close to the median of what has been inferred in, in, in clouds. So it's... it's <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Is it obvious why the filaments form so nicely and are they of a characteristic width? <laughs> yes, yep. Um, their width is, wait a minute, what am I doing? All right, I'm going to set it going again. Well, the density is, is, is more characteristic. Their density is the initial density times the square of the Mach number. And the Mach number is given by basically your free fall velocity divided by your sound speed. Quite how thick they get at that density, of course, just depends on the details of the turbulent structures, how much stuff's coming along behind and, and, and adding uh, to that. So I say, not, not pretending this is realistic, there are no magnetic fields in that, but you, even without magnetic fields, you see you get a lot of filamentary structures. And that's just the fact that if you set up random divergence-free flows, they don't stay divergence-free, 
they create density compressions and, and shocks if it's, if it's supersonic. Yeah. Yes. Um, perhaps I can have the light on again. So, roughly speaking, oh, sorry, sorry. Was it was it about the amount of turbulent energy in in there? Yes. You can you can define alpha as a ratio of the kinetic energy over the gravitational energy. There's some numerical number I don't remember out, out, out the front there, um, and observationally for molecular clouds that value is of order unity, more of order so, um, and this simulation has been set up in that way. So that gives you the... Can you use a darker Yeah, absolutely. Something like that. Okay, so, so once you've fixed that, and you know this for your cloud, then you can work out the um, mass-weighted velocity of the turbulence, that tells you how much turbulence to put in. Then you've got another thing to, to ask is what is the, uh, what, what mixture of long and short wavelengths do you put in? And that's been um, based on the Larson's first law that I was talking about uh, yesterday. Jumping ahead a bit to other lectures, it doesn't really matter what you put in for turbulence. You mustn't not put any turbulence in because if you don't, it would just implode, right? And just form stars along its axis. So you need to stir it up to start off with but the precise details of the power spectrum of what you put in doesn't have a very large bearing on what you get out, which is probably, um, probably good. So this is just a movie that Thomas made. It's really just the stars taken from the, what the, the, the explosion sausage simulation and colour coding them as they go into clusters, where the clusters are defined, remember, as just cutting the minimum spanning tree at a defined uh, radius. And the individual stars will change colour. Uh, um, nothing strange is happening dynamically here, it's just the designation is, uh, is changing a bit. But it perhaps just reinforces the idea that uh, in these simulations, at any rate, we don't know if it's true in nature, but in the simulations, cluster formation is not a top-down process, it's definitely a bottom-up process. And if you analyse them at intermediate stages, in other words, not when it's all merged at the end and formed a condensed cluster, you find that uh, it will be classified as fractal according to the Cartwright Q parameter, which is what you expect because you've got distributed uh, regions of, of high density. At the end, of course, it gets a, a higher value of the, the Q parameter because in that area, anyway, it's all gone into a, to a cluster. Now, I said you mustn't take uh, data and pull it as a histogram and put a, uh, a line through it. <laughs> so that's what I've done, just because you probably want to know um, if you were a, a very naive person and were going to do such a thing. It's not that bad compared with uh, observational data for uh, in, embedded clusters. Of course, it's over a, a pretty small mass range. You see, the, our maximum mass cluster is uh, a few hundred uh, solar masses. Um, but I think this is the first time that it's been possible to actually synthesize the creation of an even remotely statistically significant ensemble of, of clusters so that you can ask this kind of question. And what shape are they? We talked about shape yesterday um, in relation to molecular clouds. Um, these are mildly aspherical, and it's the same sort of story that, left to themselves, they want to become more spherical. Gravity is acting on them. The relaxation processes we heard about this morning from Bob are isotropizing the orbits and making your cluster more spherical, but then, of course, it keeps on being hit by other things falling in. So you go temporarily aspherical, and then you relax again. So exactly where you are on... This is, a, this is just a histogram from the simulations of the ellipticity. Um, most of them are fairly, um, fairly circular axis ratio, about one to two, but you get a few which look uh, aspherical because they've had a recent interaction. What, the clusters? Mm -hmm. um, I should think the clusters' rotation is quite negligible as a fraction of their uh, gravitational potential uh, energy. Is that um, the fairest answer, or that's what they do? Uh, has anyone actually measured? Uh, well, no, but I mean, I, 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 okay, I, no, it hasn't, it, hasn't, it hasn't been measured, but mm -hmm. it's pretty inconceivable, given the conditions from which it's, it's formed, that you'd actually retain angular momentum when you're at that kind of scale. I mean, 
these simulations start off being divergence free, but they haven't got zero vorticity. So there is angular momentum in the turbulence, mm -hmm. and that's inherited. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's, it, it's soaked up in the stellar motions. And when you collapse down to individual stars, you get disks around the stars, as you, as you should. But if you, at the stage that there are still clusters, so out at a, you know, a much larger spatial scale than the scale of disks, um, the angular momentum, um, <coughs> it's, it's a very strong hunch to say that it would be, be negligible. That's probably the reason why nobody's, lo nobody's uh, uh, looked at it. But of course, it, it could be checked out if it seemed to be important. I just thought yes. about these stochastic effects. If you have yeah. a few enough collisions, yeah. you could imagine that the last collision yeah. would have a particular angular momentum with respect to the center of the cluster. I mean, we know that yeah. open clusters rotate. That's yeah. why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. I think the reason probably why not, I mean, I, I, mean, I certainly agree, if it was a dissipationless encounter, you could, in principle, end up with two things which were you know, virtually a, a breakup, and then they would have significant angular momentum. I suspect, because this is happening in the context of, of gas, that there's somewhere else for the angular momentum uh, to go. And so what really happens is that they come in, but they don't stay out at the sort of radius. They go in and, and merge, and the angular momentum has been passed out. Um, but uh, yeah, no, actually, I, that's, uh, that, 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 is, that's, that is potentially interesting for the, for the larger scale clusters, which are going to stick around for a, for a time. That's, yeah, yeah, that's a good thought. Talking about mass segregation within these um, clusters, well, they're really strongly mass segregated. Now, it's technically, this is not primordial mass segregation, because if you ask where your stars, which end up being massive, formed, it's not in the core of a cluster. They form you know, somewhere out along those, those filaments, and then they, they fall in, and they end up in a preferential position at the core of the cluster, and they can accrete lots of material. But I think any observer, and most people studying cluster dynamics, would probably say this is primordial mass segregation, and that that's a technicality, because it's all happening within a crossing time. It's all happening in the first 0.5 uh, mega years. So I don't know whether you care or not whether it's, it's genuinely primordial or, um, uh, or not. Just a yes. question. Yeah. Do they form massive and fall to the center, no. or, or no. do they fall to the center and then accrete mass? It, it's a kind of combination, but actually the things that end up being massive, if you trace back, they're the ones that formed first in the simulation. Mm -hmm. So they get there first, mm -hmm. and they grow a bit beyond the other ones that fall in, and therefore they're in a good position to get binary companions, sling other things <coughs> out, hoover up more of the mass. So it's a very non-equitable situation, if you like. That you know, if, if you're first, if, you, if you're first with your feet in the by the trough, you can you can uh, mm -hmm. get a good meal. Um, having said that, they're mass segregated. Of course, if you've just had a merger, and I suppose this, all, this, this, this is sort of along the same line as Bob's been asking about the angular momentum. Temporarily, <laughs> your cluster is disorganized by having a, a merger, and therefore you could take a snapshot of a, a cluster in these simulations and say, oh, it's not mass segregated at all because you've got these two nuclei which are in the process of, of merging. So most of the time they're pretty mass segregated, but if you see a non-mass segregated cluster in your simulations, sorry, in your observations, you can't say, oh, this never happens in the simulations because the simulations are stochastic and sometimes they look uh, non-mass segregated temporarily. Now, this is what we started uh, uh, talking about right at the uh, beginning, about if you have this sort of theorist prerogative of being able to go into your simulation and actually really identify clumps as, as opposed to what clump find might think is a clump, is the gas that's in there going to form a star whose mass correlates with the mass of the clump? That's the question. So, nice study by uh, Smith and collaborators. They did exactly that. Um, they identified the clumps by looking for potential wells so they were actually looking at at least temporarily bound uh, structures in, in the gas. And uh, what they did was, they, in, in this plot here, they've just colour-coded them according to the masses at the time that uh, they identified them. And then later on, they can just see the masses of the stars that they produced. And you won't be able to uh, see the, the details, but the answer is there's quite a lot of scrambling up between this and this plot. So there's not a one-to-one -one correlation by any means between core mass and final star mass, but it's not a complete randomization. And if anything, it tends to be the lower mass stars which more t tend to just inherit what's around them, and the higher mass stars who, by the processes we've just been uh, uh, discussing, by uh, getting down into the core of a, of, a, of a cluster can accrete quite a lot of mass from the wider environment. Um, the 
analysis by Bernal et al. 2004 traced back the locations of all the gas particles which were going to end up in a particular massive star um, and found that in that case it was really quite distributed. I can't remember, I'm afraid, what the spatial scale of this plot is, but you can go to this paper. Uh, you wouldn't get the same story for the low-mass stars. They're low-mass because they actually haven't had that opportunity to feed uh, widely. Mm. Okay, so, th so first of all, um, there's a, a bunch of... And this is from the simulations? Of yes, this, this is an SPH simulation, and you identify a core tempor uh, in a snapshot. Yeah, right. And uh, the IMF, it's, it's also identified from the simulation? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. But so it's, it's, it's particular uh, mass function. So, so, yeah, so this is a mass function of cores, quote unquote. This is a, a mass function of stars, but the colours represent everything that started off in this mass range is red and it ends up. I'm sorry that it's so small that you can't actually see so what it is. At the yeah. end of the simulation, the stars right. are not completely formed yet, right? They are still accreting now. Absolutely, yes. That's, that's, that, 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 that certainly so, wasn't that actually. Some of them are and some of them aren't. It depends where they are. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about that more in relation to some of Matthew Bates' simulations, that the higher mass stars generally are accreting. Many of the lower mass stars have, have finished accreting. So, yes, it's not the, it's not the end of the story because yeah. this is still a gas-rich uh, uh, simulation. As I say, it doesn't completely eradicate any correlation. I'm just saying it's somewhat, it's, it, it's somewhat blurred. So this is a comparison at some time step of pre-stellar cores to yeah. sink particles that you call stars. Yeah, exactly. So it's not yeah, but you're actually tagging. You're actually tagging the material. Okay. So you, at, you, at, one, at, some, at some time you identify a bunch of cores of different masses, and then you go and look at the masses of the stars that they give rise to. So that suggests yeah. the cores yeah. survive. Yeah. So, uh, the data in those two plots yeah. isn't a snapshot yeah. at the same time. No, it isn't. No, no, it isn't. No, no. Now, what about the IMF? Um, Neil said this morning you ought to put some physics into it, so um, I think that's, that's right. And um, let me just show you, first of all, empirically what the simulations do. If you're really simple minded about thinking about this, the, um, actually, before I, I start this, I've got two or three more slides. They're, they're quite important. Do you, shall I leave them for the beginning of tomorrow, or should I uh, press on with them? There's two or three more slides, but it's, it is the IMF, so I don't want to just gallop through it. What, what do you think? That's a good idea. What? Cut now? <laughs> <laughs> so that's no, a good no, idea. I'm planning on doing the same thing, because my talk yeah. tomorrow just runs into tomorrow also. So right. Uh, I don't well, have much time yet. Oh, you have five more minutes. I have five minutes. Better not to rush. Probably better not to rush. <laughs> <laughs> why, don't, why, don't we say, why don't we say better not to rush and uh, I'll start this at the beginning. Yep, okay, that's, that's good. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, so before we talked about mass aggregation and yeah. about the position yeah. of the massive stars, yeah. Well, specifically, the particular diagnostic that we were using there, you can see it, it's a, a histogram of the fractional radial ranking of, of the most massive star in the cluster. So you take all your stars in a given cluster and you rank them by, by radius. Um, and uh, so the, the one furthest out has got one in this variable and the one closest in has got zero. And then you ask for that cluster, where is its most massive star to be found? And if the most massive star was found anywhere in that cluster, you'd expect this to be a, uh, a flat distribution. But in fact, they're not. They're preferentially found closer to the centre of the cluster. And so in this kind of histogram, they're more or most often found you know, within the inner 10, 20% of the total, uh, I won't say mass of the cluster because it's not mass weighted, the total number of, of stars in the cluster. So I don't know whether you call that mass segregation or not, but that's the specific um, uh, basis for that claim. Yeah. Because if the, mass, the massive stars were located where most of the stars are located, mm -hmm. then yeah. that would 
That's what I'm saying. I'm saying if, 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 they were, if they were the same, this would be flat. But it's not flat. It's peaked at, at low centiles. So if, it was always at the, if they were always at the origin, if they were always there, they were the innermost star, you have a spike there. If they were always the outermost star, they'd be there. If they were just like all the other stars on average, then it would be flat. But in fact, it's, it's like that. So, so they're pretty close to the centre. Yes. Uh, so going back to the two-point correlation function from the mm. beginning of your slides. Oh, the, 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 yes, the, the uh, mean surface density of companions. It, it, yeah. Yes, it's related to the two-point correlation okay. function. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, so uh, would it, do you think it would be mm. valuable for comparing between observations mm. and simulations? Like, it might be hard to interpret all by itself, but uh, if you have simulations and have observations, it seems like you could look at the different functions and do uh, statistics to find some error band and then yeah. compare. I mean, I, I tend to agree. Any simulation which is correct must satisfy all the observational diagnostics, including that particular one. Um, when we did all our sort of playing with this, um, the synthetic clusters and what they did in this, um, uh, in, in this plot, one of Richard Larson's original claims was that the break in this plot tells you about the genes length, and therefore it could be very useful for that reason. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily, because remember, this is the binary regime, and so this regime doesn't de depends on the number of binary stars, the fraction of, of stars that have binary companions. It doesn't depend on the surface density of the background. But if you take a simulation and you've got loads and loads of foreground stars in your cluster, so you've got a large column density, what's out here comes up, and therefore where that intercepts this plot just depends basically on the density of the cluster you're looking at. So seeing whether it compares is to some extent asking how dense is my cluster and where does it intercept the binary regime. Um, that's, that, that's something that you could check that it, that it matches. If you are pretty good at removing mm. contaminants like mm. uh, an x-ray survey or something, yeah. uh, would that, uh, would it be more useful yes actually I wasn't thinking about I mean you're, you're quite right I mean x-rays are great for getting rid of contaminants but on the other hand I wasn't even thinking of contaminants I was just saying a denser cluster you know Orion compared with Taurus that's what that's what we found when we did that you know Orion intersects up here and Taurus intersects down there uh, I don't think there's anything intrinsically different about the binary uh, <coughs> distribution but you're looking through a, a bigger a, a bigger depth so they're not field stars, it's just the ambient cluster background. Yeah, abso absolutely, yeah. Th 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 this is not, this is not uh, field stars, no. It's, it's, it's the complete sample in Taurus. And they're, all, they're all T Tauri stars that are doing that. And the fact that it's a slope is showing you, as I say, if it was a uniform density background, it would be flat, but the fact that it's, it's going down is giving you some indication that there's some structure there. But of course, if you eyeball Taurus, you know there was some structure there. It's, it's full of little, uh, little groups. That's an excellent question, but I'm actually devoting a whole lecture to that subject. So, um, in fact, it's now getting to the stage where you can start to put feedback in, and that's very recent work by a number of groups, and it's very interesting. So I'll, I'll delay that till, till I give them the lecture, and then perhaps we can discuss it more. <laughs>